Hello. Today, I want to visit with you about historical climate patterns in the Southern Great Plains. My name is Albert Sutherland. I'm actually a certified crop advisor and certified professional horticulturalist. I am not a trained meteorologist or climatologist, so I really approach weather and climate from an agriculture perspective. I have a BS from Oregon State University and an MS from Ohio State University. I've been working at Oklahoma State University since 1989. And since 2002, I've been the Oklahoma Mesonet Agriculture Coordinator. And it's really in that role that I've spent a lot of time with weather and climate and then looking at the kind of information that can be used in a farm type setting. When we start talking about climate, we really need to differentiate between climate and weather. And they go back and forth, but long-term averages and the variability of weather is really what makes up climate. So the weather is what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Climate is really what happens over years, decades, centuries. And that climate is based on the weather patterns and extremes and seasonal patterns and extremes. And we'll see some examples of that as we look at some climate patterns for the Great Plains, both in Kansas and in Oklahoma. When we start looking at our climate record, the first thing that we have available to us is data. And the longest set of data that we have really comes from the National Weather Service, their Cooperative Observer Network. And these were people who were volunteers who would record rainfall rates each day as well as the minimum and maximum air temperatures. More recently, the data that we have is additional data sensors, so now we have things like sunlight and relative humidity, dew points, but those are on automated weather networks. The data is collected automatically and then processed and made available through the internet. When we go back past our data record, we start looking at things like the tree rings, sediment deposits, plant and animal fossils, coral reefs, ice cores. All of these things are used to really reconstruct what the climate conditions were like. If we look at tree rings, we start looking at centuries or a few thousand years. Sediment deposits take us a little bit farther back as well as plant and animal fossils, coral reefs as well. When we start looking at ice cores, we actually can get into hundreds of thousands of years. What we think of climate is based on our human experiences, and each of us have different experiences. So the weather patterns and extremes that we've been, we've experienced, those seasonal patterns and extremes really begin to form what our expectation is of the climate. Our ecosystems that are around us, the plants and animals, from an agriculture perspective, the crop type and culture, even things like our weeds, insects, and diseases that are present, those are all give us an idea of what the weather patterns are like and what our climate is like. For livestock, it really comes down to forage type and that production cycle. So when does the forage grow? What kind of quantities do we have there for the animals to feed on? So when we're thinking of climate, one of the things that I picture is tree rings. And it really gives me an, that seasonality, the variations between years and the multiple years that mount up. Looking at a cross section of a very old tree, we can see that you can go back many hundreds of years and take a look at when there were things like the mega droughts, those really dry times that really changed societies and how people functioned. When we take a look at the variability within the climate, you know, someplace like San Diego has very narrow variability. In fact, you almost don't need weather forecasts because the weather is so constant from day to day, even from season to season. Compare that with a place like the Great Plains where we have extremely high variability and we can see rapid shifts, not only between days, but in the same day really dramatic changes. 
So that variability is really important when we start looking at extremes and how that climate bears out. When we take a look at some of that variability in Oklahoma, we go back to 2011. That year, we set a new cold temperature record in Nawada of minus 31 degrees Fahrenheit. So here we have a winter with one of the coldest days on record. And then we get into a summer in that same year where we had a record number of above 100 degree Fahrenheit temperatures. Down at Grandfield, there was 101 days that came in above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The old state record was 86. So in this same year, we went from record cold to record heat. And we see that consistently in the Great Plains, that large swing in variability. So one of the ways that we can look at climate that we've had available to us recently is to not just look at the annual, in this case, precipitation, but to look at a running average. And that's what the brown and the green fill on this chart represent. The diamonds are the annual precipitation. This would be for Oklahoma across the entire state. And then the running average gives us an idea of when we're in a dry time or a longer wet time. So we can go back and see those droughts that are talked about in the 50s, the Dust Bowl back in the 30s. In Oklahoma, the 1910s were very, very dry. And then we get into a period of extended moisture and that went from the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s. So we had almost 30 years of above average moisture. What happened when the next drought came along from 2010 to early 2015 is people's expectations were really based on those previous three decades of above average rainfall. So even just coming back to the long-term average of close to 34 inches, people perceive that as being dry when we could see through the climate record that really there were those periods when we had very severe dry times where the rainfall might be down closer to even 20 inches. So that's one of the things that we get from this chart is we can actually go through and see what those driest times were. So the driest year on record for Oklahoma was 1911. That was 19 inches of rainfall. Wettest came in in 1957 and that was 48 inches of rainfall. So that's the spread that we're looking at in terms of that statewide average. We also have this long-term run for temperature. And one of the things about temperature is that we can go through and again, pick out those drought periods. The 1950s and 30s were very warm. They were above average, the red areas. The 1910s were interesting because we had a severe drought, but we also had below average temperatures looking at the long-term average from 1895 to 2014. And then as we move into the last decades from the mid-90s on, we see an above average temperature trend for the entire state of Oklahoma. The range on this, 57 degrees to 63 degrees. So we're not seeing as much variation in that annual average of temperature as we see in the annual average of precipitation. Well, we've seen this new drought play out in our wheat yields. This is actually looking at wheat yields from 1919 through 2014. And it's really the end of this chart that we want to take a look at a little bit more closely. So let me pull that up. If you take a look at 1973 to 2005, there were 33 crops and only one of those was below 100 million bushels. 
Then from 2006 to 2014, we had nine crops, five of those below 100 million bushels. So we really saw a huge change in the consistency from 1973 to 2005 to a much more variable climate from 2006 to 2014. When we start looking at the years, 2006, we had a drought, 2007, late freeze and rain at harvest, 2009, late freeze, 2011, drought, and 2014, drought and late freeze. And one of the things about a drought is that it takes water out of the system so we are going to see more variability, not only in terms of moisture amounts, but also in terms of air temperature. So that moisture really has a buffering effect from some of our weather extremes. One of the tools that we have available to us is through SKIP, and this is a really nice tool from this group and we can go to the data tools where the blue box is and then go down to historical climate trends tool and now what we can do is we can pull up the same chart that we looked at for Oklahoma but for any state in the 48 continental U.S. states we'll also be able to look at different climate divisions. So this is the same kind of precipitation chart that we looked at for Oklahoma now for Kansas with the annual amounts, the little green squares, and then we can see the wet and dry periods. The green being the wet, the brown being the dry from that five-year running average. One of the things that we see for the state is that in 1951, they had the highest rainfall amount and that was 41 inches. And then in 1956, they had one of the driest years for this 1895 to 2014 period, and that was at 15 inches. We can also drill down to the individual climate divisions. So this would be the climate division in the southwest part of Kansas, division number seven. And now we see the average drop down to 19. And I'm going to just go backwards. One slide we can see here, the average for the state was 27 inches. If we drop back here, 19. Now our range is the driest year, 1956, was 8 inches. The wettest year was 28 in 1941. So we can see a very different range when we get into a drier climate division than what we see for the entire state. Let's compare this to a wetter area in Kansas. This would be for the Northeast Climate Division. Now our average is up close to 34 inches. When we take a look at our wettest year, that was 1973, and we have 55 inches. Our driest was 19 in 1988. So if we look at the Northeast, the driest year was only a nine inches less of moisture than the wettest year in the Southwest in Kansas. So those climate divisions really make a difference. And this tool is really handy for drilling down and really seeing what the climate is like over this last 100-year period for the climate division that you're in. When we start taking a look at longer records, one of the things that really jumps out is that there were some what's called mega droughts. You may have heard that term. And that's really where droughts lasted not just years, but actually decades. So in some cases, 40, 50 years of drought. And this is where some of the Indian cultures that were highly adapted to drought, they were not even able to function and collapse. So this is one of the concerns that we have going ahead is, would we run into a mega drought? And if so, would we be prepared? And it really points us to the need to plan for drought times, to have a plan in preparation 
so that we can adapt to that to have some drought triggers for our own farm operations, our own livestock operations, but also through those plans, what happens when things turn around and we get the kind of surprise rains that we've had in May of 2015? How do we take advantage of those? And that's really what that planning is all about. Planning for the dry times, but being prepared for the good times. Well, that's just a very quick overview of the kind of historical climate that we've seen here in the Southern Great Plains, both for Oklahoma and for Kansas. If you want more information on climate, we would encourage you to take a look at the Great Plains Grazing org website. Well, thanks for watching this video and we hope it's been informative for you.